If you'd like to get in touch with the Linux lads with any questions, feedback, or suggestions for topics you'd like us to cover, um, then we'd love to hear from you. We have some handy dandy redirect links on our domain. You can find us on linuxlads.com forward slash Twitter, forward slash Mastodon, forward slash Telegram. You can also buy some merch at linuxlads.com forward slash store. And if you want, you can just send us an email at show at linuxlads.com. We also have a pretty active gaming channel, which is currently by invitation, but we could possibly open that up to the public in future if there's demand for it. Just shout us out on any of our socials if you want to be added to that. Um, you can also join our Steam community, so you can see when we're online and gaming. We all like to play games occasionally, so uh, yeah, just jump in and have a game with us. That'd be really cool. Just search for Linux Lads on Steam or just click the link in the show notes. You can, of course, get all of our episodes on iTunes, Spotify, YouTube, or you can subscribe directly to our RSS feed in your favorite podcatcher. Hello and welcome to the Linux Lads. This is the only Linux podcast that always gives you your money back. As usual, I'm Shane. I'm Gunnar. And I'm Mike. And yeah, as I said, we're the Linux Lads. Today, we're all feeling the January blues, the cold blues a little bit, so... uh, we're just going to have a little chatty episode we're, we're no interview, no discussion, no nothing like that. We're just going to talk about what's been happening this week and, you know, see what happens. First up, very interesting little story. Um, Godot gets 120 grand in grant money um, from game developer Kefir. Kefir, am I saying that right? I honestly have no idea. I've never heard of that game, game developer before. <laughs> That's a type of drink as well, though, I think. It's something, I mean, at least in, like, Central Europe, kefir is the kind of cream that you put into coffee, if I remember correctly, my teenage years. You kind of get that in a in a little plastic tub, and you open it, and you pour it into a coffee. That, I think, is kefir, at least where I'm from. Ah, Don't know what it means anywhere else. That's uh, interesting. But in here, it's apparently a game developer that's behind games like uh, I have to find out because I don't know games. Day on F, Grim Soul, and Frostborn. At least those are mentioned in the Gaming on Linux uh, article. So thank you, Liam. Uh, is it pronounced Liam or Liam? Liam. Liam. Okay, thanks. Yeah, so thank you, that guy. Um, and yeah, so basically he reports that announcing uh, that uh, yeah, Godot, uh, Godot Engine is getting $120,000 for as a grant from these uh, this these kefir people who use it to prototype games so it's awesome uh open source project that's obviously giving a great value to commercial enterprises and hopefully this will make it even better i think they have got an upcoming godot 4 release don't they yeah soon with uh some kind of Im- like with a lot of improvements in it i think it's going to be time for me to check it out again um, absolutely yeah i've I've been following the godot project for some time like it's it's just a really interesting project i i actually uh, i went to fosdem a number of years ago and i actually spoke to the developers at their stand um and i got a i got a godot t-shirt and that i, that I still wear to this day <laughs> yeah it's an amazing project and it's especially what i love about not just that it's free and open source but that the uh, the way it's done is very accessible for someone like me, a bit of a code luddite. Um, for someone who 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 isn't terribly proficient with code, like it has a you know an understanding of the concepts and all that kind of thing, but you know isn't a coder. Um, but so it's actually quite accessible, like the, the how it's structured, like the node system that they have in Godot. Um, I find it really interesting, and it's all instances and stuff. It's all very object based. I think that's why they use it for prototyping because you can whip up something fairly quickly with the interface they provide and with the easy to use, uh, you know, aspect of it. I've seen mobile app development in it because you can export an APK from it if you have the right libraries, um, which is really interesting. I've done that once. I've developed ah. Elisa. <laughs> well, developed is a strong word for what I did. Elisa wanted a um, bingo app that I'm not sure if she ever used, but you know, just something like a more like a soundboard than anything. You hit on a, uh, you hit on a, uh, like a, you know, in a grid. I, I you probably know better how bingo works than I do. I've never played it, but <laughs> you have like you hit on the bingo, yeah. in the tile on the tile with the letter with the number and it says something like a number nine or whatever so yeah so so that's that's my um that's the total amount of me of my 
Android games development, but I did it in Godot, uh, Godot uh, like six years ago. Maybe Kefir should support us on Kofi. Nice one. Getting those people, this, uh, these companies um, supporting open source is always a good thing. I mean, it reminds me of the, all the dollar-dollar uh, bills, yo, that, um, that the Blender Foundation or the Blender ap- application is getting because all of the graphics developers and game developers are uh, like the big ones um, are supporting and injecting money into Blender. Now it seems to be that it's... Um, a small bit of Godot's turn. Yeah, it's a whole, it's a whole ecosystem, exactly. So, yes, yeah, the whole ecosystem is it's always great to see. I mean, they're they're giving back because they they themselves are obviously making money off selling games, and um, and then it's kind of giving back to the people that support them. So, if they're using the Godot engine, then by all means, um, send money back their way. Uh, I do not know if it's a once off donation or is it reoccurring do they are they committing to do kind of um something like the sponsorship model where it's like a bronze sponsorship or silver sponsor or pl- platinum sponsorship that um that uh blender seems to be having that where it's a reoccurring thing but uh i, I don't know if it's a once off or not uh, i'm scanning the article to see if it mentions it and i don't believe it does but if either way it's it's always it's always good to see it looks like one off but you know it's it's stark contrast right so these people this uh, kefir people who i've you know, I, I've heard of some major, you know, if you were a very rich major game studio, I would have heard of you. Like, I know who EA are, right? But these people I've never heard of. That means that they are not the richest uh, game studio ever. And yet they feel it uh, necessary. Like, they feel it gives them value to drop $120,000 on an open source project. Contrast that with Amazon, who has got infinite money, or Apple, or, you know, Google. And yeah, they are something, but like uh, Amazon, who's been constantly in the news throughout the last few years for um, kind of, let's say, abusing open source licenses and basically borrowing other people's projects, putting it on their infrastructure and making it so that the other people can't make money of the project anymore because it runs for free on Amazon, you know, and Amazon are, maybe they are contributing upstream, but they are definitely not paying for it. So it it is, it is interesting that in game development and in design like where Blender is, there is a lot of money being handled to at least these two projects. And whilst in like web development, uh, that doesn't seem to be the case. Maybe somebody has got different, you know, maybe somebody has got a different experience and maybe somebody from Amazon can write to us and tell us, no, look, we've donated uh, $2 billion to SSL because we found it behind the couch <laughs> or something. But uh, uh you know, it's 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 amazing that uh, there's a lot of money from these small developers. I think it actually trickles down as well because um, I I heard, um, well, the Blender springs to mind just from the fact that I don't know if they did what I'm about to say specifically, but they spring to mind as the most token example of uh, um, open source development getting loads of money is they themselves got loads of money, but then... Um, out of that pool, out, they themselves donated, so they passed it on uh, an additional one step. So I don't know if Blender themselves did that. I think was the um, was I think it might have been um, like you guys feel free to correct me, or also the audience feel free to cl- uh, correct me, or the listeners feel free to correct me on this one as well. But I think it wasn't the um, the Gnome Foundation were donated something like a Bitcoin or something like that or something like that, and then they themselves they themselves passed on the money to smaller projects and smaller developers, which is always good. Yeah, that definitely happened. I think just today I heard uh, I read, heard I, I read somewhere that Mozilla donated money to the Rust Foundation, not the game Rust, to the programming language. You know that Mozilla first developed and then it spun off into its own thing. I think mm-hmm. Mozilla is sponsoring them, and that's like another example of what you're saying that. Uh, open source projects get money. I hate the <laughs> phrase uh, "trickle down," Margaret. <laughs> I love the fact that you're using every word, but use the word "trickle down." It it it, it moves on to the next project in um, in a hierarchical way. Um. It is 
yeah, f- f- through through medium of small droplets, right? But uh, <laughs> it is it is uh, it is hard to avoid. But it, I don't like losing it because that kind of evokes uh, the lady that's not for turning. Uh, I think it's like he's using water, same water analogy, but you could say downstream, couldn't you? I just, I'd really hate it when he gets all Keynesian on me. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I know, but basically, I will try to find that. Uh, but uh, well, it's not that. Uh, it's not that. Uh, like, yeah, no, if if I'm right and Mozilla has donated money to Rust Foundation, then it will be in the show notes. If I'm wrong and making shit up, then we will never mention it again. <laughs> that's uh, as solid a guarantee as you can get on any podcast we don't do retractions <laughs> what, what do you call it corrections I, anyway to move on uh, i just had to mention this because it stuck out to me um good old wimpy martin wimpress friend of the show he's been on the podcast in the past mm-hmm. met him in person many times lovely fellow shared beers with him very nice fellow Salt of the earth. <laughs> I, 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 I shared a very severe hangover with him one one nog camp. Um and uh well I don't I don't actually think he was that hungover. I I think I was doing all the work. <laughs> but um uh but yeah, he's Ubuntu Desktop Leave has announced he is leaving Canonical. Oh um so it's sad to see him move on, but um from I think he was on Linux Unplugged and he explains that it's something uh, that he, I think he's becoming a developer advocate or something like that, and he said he's always enjoyed that aspect of the of it was part of um his develop his development job in Canonical anyway, and particularly as desktop lead because where you're talking about Ubuntu and you want to showcase it, but he said he particularly enjoyed that aspect of it, so now he gets to focus on that solely and I believe it's some kind of um, new starter company or startup company that's based in the States, but they say that he, he said that all of their workers are remote anyway, so they can work from anywhere around in the world. But I think they, their physical offices offices are in the States. I wish them all the best of luck. And um, there's rumours as to who's going to be the, well, just rumours circulating, just idle speculation. And no names have come out of the pot just yet as to who's going to be his replacement. But he said that it's actually quite unusual that all of this is being talked about anyway because he's well known to the community so maybe that's the reason why it's all being talked about but he says if you imagine these kind of things don't tend to make news but I think he he thinks it's making news because he was just so well known to the community anyway um, him being a podcaster a fellow podcaster being on the Ubuntu podcast he appears on various other podcasts including our own yeah we, we actually we made him famous let's admit it right <laughs> yeah I, th- I think I think we got um trickle down podcast guests <laughs> in that case you won't forget it now will you so Jingos, or Jingos, I guess it is, uh, the Linux tablet distro releases its first alpha build um, and actually looks kind of interesting um, because target, it's the first Linux distro targeted at tablets specifically. Is that alpha build going to be for every young? <laughs> oh, lovely. God. You know what? You're old because you said it, and I'm old because I got I got it. Yeah, it was not ever, even a very. There was a bit of a screw on this one. I didn't even get the joke. I don't know if I was meant to get the joke, but I didn't. But you see, there was this thing called the '80s. So, from looking into it and from watching the videos that I've I've seen demonstrating it, it seems to be targeting people who are familiar with iOS on the uh, iPad. Um, as in their usual workflows where they normally swipe down from where their normal gestures, those kind of things. So people who have that kind of mus- uh, muscle memory, um, it, they would uh, seem to be, they'd be able to transition somewhat seamlessly over to this uh, once it becomes a final release and becomes stable and so on, which is smart because uh, unfortunately to a lot of people, I'm not one of them, but to a lot of people, uh, iPad and tablet are interchangeable. <laughs> Doesn't matter who the manufacturer of it. I have this Samsung iPad. No, well, no oh, you don't. Oh, how I hate that. <laughs> oh, how I hate that. Uh, but yeah, uh, so it's very 
smart. They rather than trying to reinvent the the whole um, UI uh, interface paradigm, they said, "Listen, the vast majority of people out there have this kind of workflow. They're used to this." that this muscle memory for swiping here to get at their settings and swiping there to get at their Wi-Fi or whatever, there's no point in fighting it, so we might as well embrace it. So uh, as far as I'm aware, that is what they're targeting, that it would be somewhat familiar to people who have that kind of muscle memory. They have to be very careful, otherwise Apple will slap them with a lawsuit. I pretty imagine Apple has got this pretty much fenced. Yeah. As someone who very much has that kind of muscle memory someone who's a big fan of tablets yeah this is amazing news like really really great i can't wait to try it out i know my my girlfriend has a, a shitty android tablet that i bought her for a birthday and then it was just, <laughs> I, just so nice. I just made a crap decision and you know it wasn't it wasn't what what she needed and yeah so it's it's just kind of and i, I even said to her last week i was like maybe i could put linux on your tablet and she was like yeah all right i don't care <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> and then uh but uh but basically yeah i'd be very interested in trying this out because i actually i treated myself last year mid pandemic or mid kind of initial lockdown back when it was cool to a very sexy samsung tab like 10 x z ultra or whatever i don't know uh, i i honestly don't know the the model but um yeah really really fancy ass samsung tablet it's like the equivalent of an ipad in screen resolution and everything all that kind of thing um i would be very very reluctant to to flash that because it, it was so expensive but uh, but yeah if i if, if i can get my hands on that old crappy android tablet that's laying around the house not being used then i will certainly give this a go this one has got this uh from this omg ubuntu article uh they quote two reference tablets uh, or devices actually not tablets devices for this that means these are where uh, these two devices are where the operating system works the is best right and one is the surfix pro 6 and then the other one is huawei mate book 14 which if i'm not mistaken are both kind of hybrid laptops mm. Now, I have a hybrid laptop, and I don't have a fancy uh, Surface or a Huawei Mate book. Uh, I bought a, a little cheap thing from Alibaba, and I can tell you that if you want to... It's not just about uh, about the user interface, which obviously need to be need to be adjusted for touch, but like you have to make sure that when you take the thing, you open it and you twist it around so that suddenly from a laptop you have a tablet that it understands uh, that, it's a lap that, lap that it's a laptop mode and that the keyboard, for example, and the touchpad don't stop working the, so that they stop working because otherwise you grab it and you are touching the keyboard and you are still pressing the keys and they are still doing things, right? Is that yeah. added functionality that that they need to figure out for it to be perfectly usable as like the surface six when you, is when you have windows on it right another thing is uh, my i don't know if this is normal with linux tablets but uh, my thing when i turn it around that means that uh, uh, the gyro kicks in or whatever you call it and it's meant to turn the screen around it goes black for a second so it's not like in android or ios where you have a smooth transition uh if i i, I don't remember ever well anyway uh uh, one second. Uh, yeah, I think, yeah. But I, I, let's not test in production. But you have a smooth transition right? on on Android. It it basically kind of animated transition where you where everything turns from portrait to landscape and the other way around. This blacks out for a for a visible amount of time. I I remember when Android used to do that though. Yeah, it's. Uh, I can't imagine this being like, at least to me, that's a major disturbance. I remember I had a phone where you actually literally had to push a button to change the portrait <laughs> yeah but it was like 2010 right um in other news gnome 40 has been released um gnome gnome whatever takes your poison uh well it hasn't been released but it's certainly been previewed um and they're uh, creating a lot of anger and burning pitchforks and everything like that in the community because they've changed things changed things yet again Mainly the the burning pitchforks is the whole of is now rather than the multitasking view being uh, vertical, it's now horizontal, um, which I 
I don't particularly mind. I I haven't really used the the multitasking view that often. Any time that I'm in um, anything that's based off GNOME, um, I just tend to drag the windows around like I no- normally would on on uh, just on one screen. Um, even the workplace switching and stuff like that, I just don't tend to use them. Even on Android, I just don't tend to <laughs> like very task focused I'm like yeah if I need to I'll I'll drag things to one corner or whatever but w- once they're on my screen and I can see them then uh, then that's how I interact with them uh yeah if 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 my something else was on another screen I'll guarantee you I'll forget about it and then the only time that I'll be aware of it is when um my I want to shut down the operating system when they're like did you know this other thing is open? I'm like, oh yeah. <laughs> uh, so yeah, I I don't tend to use those those workplace uh, space uh, uh, functionality on any desktop environment that I'm on. In fact, in in any time that they they enable that by default, I literally first thing I do is I right click and I go and go, no, 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 and then get rid of <laughs> like. <laughs> I do, I do use it um, myself, but uh, not as much as I used to. Um, yeah, it's just it's only when I'm doing something that I really, really have to concentrate on and I need to switch between things uh, very easily, then I will use it. So I'll have a workspace for X and a workspace for Y, um, but I'll never go more than two usually. I can't imagine my my life without them, but uh, I have uh, I have a set amount. Like GNOME does it down, dynamically, uh, I have four because I'm on KDE. I think there's a hack to to have four uh, to have dynamically allocated workspaces, but I don't need it. But the GNOME thing, I think it breaks some people's workflow specifically if they have like two monitors. So yeah. um, you had or two or three, right? So you have GNOME does the one one thing that it locks. Uh, so if you have two screens, you have a main screen, a secondary one, and it locks the uh, locks the uh, secondary screen so you only have dynamically allocated back uh, workspaces i think only on the primary screen and uh, i don't know if you can change it but i think you might be able to change it now but i think that's going away right because uh they were uh yeah i think they they, they are going to a lot of people are complaining for reasons like yeah i was sitting on the tree and you started to cutting it down right and i am like i am all for progress Mm -hmm. but then um and i think gnome is perfect like it should definitely do this like there should be a desktop environment that is boldly going down and going where no other no other (laughs) environment has ever gone before and i'm pretty sure there is space for uh for like designers and developers who are not worried about losing a few users here and there what is the problem is that we also need something that the user or the users also need something to, to to be able to rely on so they should like be two gnomes like one the stable one that's never changing like something that you will see on every ubuntu and then something that's like out there with just just the hot pot of ideas that's constantly changing not saying that it's unstable like not i'm not saying that it's not meant to be working all the time like glitch free but with new ideas new design uh workflows that kind of thing right but <laughs> yes it's 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 gnome jim but not as we know it. um <laughs> uh well just when you're thinking that is like the, the solid stable dependable doesn't change uh i think of that as gnome and then the out there fucky ideas is pop os <laughs> it's it's very nice and clean and sexy but it's again it ran into that workspace issue that you mentioned specifically mike it, it, the dual monitors it switches your workspace on one monitor other the other monitor i don't know what's going on there it just yeah i think i i, I recall i think it was on the latest uh, linux unplugged um that they one of the chief complaints was something was in relation to that was the multi monitor support and uh, report, reportedly the problem is going to continue on into GNOME forty and the reason why is they said they cannot remote remote test for that scenario so they're aware of it oh, yeah, being right. 
they they're aware of it being a testing blind spot but unfortunately there's not much they can do about it at the moment because they cannot remote test for multi monitors well yeah that's a concern but you know when i also heard many complaints about a related issue that fedora is uh, is uh, going to use in 34 uh, in Fedora 34 and in Ubuntu 21, uh, sorry, 2110, I think, or 21, no, 2104. 04, yeah. It looks like Wayland is going to be the default in Fedora, in the new Fedora, and maybe in the new Ubuntu, I'm not sure about that. Pipewire is going to be the new default, which is something that both, both Pulse, Pulse Audio and if you want Jack, also Jack is going to be plugged into, right? And uh, people are concerned uh, that this will obviously make it even harder for new people because Fedora and to a certain extent Ubuntu might be testing something that might not be 100% working. And I'm thinking, well, yeah, but how are they going to, how else are they going to test it? Like uh, Fedora is a, uh, specifically Fedora is a well, uh, like popular distribution that has got quite a lot of users i assume we never know the numbers but we assume that it's very popular and we assume that fedora users are a bit more technical like above the average right at least i do so i think this is and that they like the kind of fast pace of development they like to be able to be on the cutting edge of things otherwise they'd be running something else so it's exactly that place that that they exactly that kind of production where they in my opinion have to test it there is no other place for them to do this uh, because you cannot just automate test or a remote test. You cannot just have like, no matter how big your QA department is, some things will never come up. So it's better if they, if they want to make progress and progress, to be honest, uh, the state of Linux audio specifically and the st- state of uh, X server, the progress is necessary. And uh, we need to be able to test it and Fedora are going to test it for us. And you Fedora users like me are going to test it. So I think, that's fair, you know. Um, if if they if they add something, if if there is a massive pushback against the gnome thing, if like everybody and their dog will say no, I'm 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 leaving gnome, then maybe the gnome developers will kind of go back to the drawing board and say I don't know. Well, maybe we just make we just go back horizontal with those or vertical. I don't know which one is which now. Anyway, rent and. Uh, so that about wraps it up for this uh, fortnight. Um, we'll be back in two weeks. Um, same bat channel, same bat time. Exactly. Um, as usual, I've been Shane. I've been Connor. And I've been Mike.